Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, as always, if you are a guest on behalf of this congregation, we want to tell you thank you for being here. And we are humbled by your presence. We are encouraged by your presence. And we hope that the time that you have given us this morning will be of a time of encouragement to you. Uh, and that you are welcome in this place at any time as you choose. Very, very thankful for that. So I was listening to a segment of, uh, of news again the other day. And the word claim kept appearing in that segment. Kept hearing it over and over and over. So and so claims. Such and such is the claim. This leader claims. This other news outlet claims. How would you define claim? A lot of the time we would just say a claim is, well, this is mine. I'm going to claim it. But that's not the case. Webster's Dictionary actually defines claim in this way. Quote, to state or assert something, even though it may be disputed or doubted, as true. To state or assert something, even though it may be disputed or doubted, as true. Do you know that the Bible that you hold in your hands makes numerous claims? Do you know that the Bible that you hold in your hands and perhaps read every day or every other day as time allows makes numerous assertions? Perhaps by itself or concerning itself, the Bible will say that even though it's written by men or written over the span of about a thousand to fourteen hundred years, different nations, different circumstances, different times, it will still claim that it is produced by God, God breathed. Perhaps even if you go to Christ himself, that the words that he spoke are recorded for us in this Bible. And that he makes claims. He makes assertions. He makes something. That even though it may be disputed. Even though it may be doubted by those who hear it. Is still true. He will say on one occasion. I am from above and you are from below. He'll say on another occasion that. I am greater than Abraham. And he will even say that is still one of the most radical claims to this very day and shakes those who seek religious freedom, if you will. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a powerful assertion, don't you think? Powerful claim. Can I tell you that there is one claim that is in the Bible that is head and shoulders above them all? It's one claim that is the most important, it is the most powerful, and should we accept the evidence that's there and take it under consideration, it is life-changing. You want to know what it is? He is risen. That's the claim. That is the assertion. That is the something of the entire Bible. That he died, that he's buried, that he is risen. But let's say that this phrase, he is risen, actually turns out to be a lie. What if, what if it turns out to be the biggest myth of them all? What happens? How many of you ever played Jenga? I, we love it. I mean, we love it in our family. We played it over Christmas with my family. We just like it. You know, you're trying to be still. You don't want to knock it over. Don't get too close. Don't get too excited. But everybody knows that as, as a whole is being produced, when a block that's being pulled out, no one knows what it is, but everybody knows there's one block that once it's pulled out, the entire tower of blocks falls in on itself. No one knows which one it is just happens that if you pull it out, it's going to fall completely down. And there is, there's little left standing. Do you know that the resurrection, that based on the New Testament preachers, the New Testament writers, that if the resurrection is not true, 
the entire Christian faith is worthless. It is the block. Now we focus a lot in our day and age on the death. But if you were to read through the entire sermons that are recorded for us in the book of Acts, it's not the death. Oh, it's mentioned. Make no mistake, it's mentioned. It's the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus is still dead in a tomb somewhere in the Middle East, everything that we've done up to this point is a colossal waste of time. Everything. The song didn't matter. The prayer didn't matter. The drinking of juice, the eating of bread, the patting on the back and saying to someone, it's so good to see you here. All of that's worthless. All of that's meaningless. The way that the scripture would describe it is that it's all in vain. Because it's a colossal waste of time. The claim of the scripture is that he is risen. And it's, to a certain extent, it is an either or. Either he is alive or he is not. There is no in between. There is no gray area. There isn't something to where I, I, well maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Either he is or he isn't. And the Bible puts us in a position, God puts us in a position where eventually a decision must be made. That's, that's Paul in, the, in our reading this morning. That's, that's Paul's assertion. That the speaker, whether it's in a private setting or in a public setting, the, the teacher, the preacher of God's word, it doesn't matter who it is. Private or public, it don't really matter. That person should know he or she is just, just a servant. They don't matter. We don't need a name. Because the goal of God's word, and specifically the goal of the gospel, is for the person who's hearing it to believe. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do that here in the next 20 or 25 minutes. So if that happens, it's great. See, the thing about the Bible is that it doesn't leave a claim as a claim. It doesn't just make an assertion and then move on. It actually provides evidence. So what I want us to do, whether it's you've been in the faith for years upon years, or whether you're brand new to this, or maybe inserting yourself after a hiatus of years, is that what the scripture does is that it welcomes investigation. And all it asks is that we would be open and honest and genuine, and that we will sit at the table and just take things under consideration. So all that I would ask of all of us. Is that let's just take things under consideration. And if you want to go further after this lesson. I know you can ask any one of us. And we will be happy to walk with you. On that. The first piece of evidence that the Apostle Paul provides. And I need to stop here in a moment. We're going to assume the scripture is true. Is that okay? I understand that that has a place in the discussion, but for the sake of time, we're going to assume that it is. And I know we don't like the word assume. I know there are some that have that doubt, so I hope you know what I mean. I believe that it is true, but we're going to assume that everybody here is going to take that stance. The first thing that the Apostle Paul gives under consideration as a piece of evidence is the Scripture itself. He will say in, in a very shorthand, a summary of the entire Bible, not just the entire New Testament, but the entire Bible, what we call the gospel. It's a definition that most of us that wear the name of Christ is the one that we know of the most. If, one, if you were to ask us, or if someone were to ask us, what, what is the gospel, we would repeat this. We may not get book, chapter, and verse, but we would say these elements. Death, burial, and resurrection. When Paul is writing this, under inspiration of the Spirit, he says this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. If you underline, if you feel comfortable underlining in your Bible, writing in the margin of your Bible, or if you're taking notes in a little notebook, the phrase of these two verses is in accordance 
with the Scriptures. And the audience that Paul would have been writing to at that time, maybe even perhaps preaching to or teaching in a house church at that moment, there are two things that would have come to their mind. First and foremost, it would have been the 39 books that we call the the Old Testament. Probably better called the Hebrew Scriptures, because they come from our forefathers, those, uh, those individuals that were committed to God's Word, received the promises, received the covenants. Better known as the Hebrew Scriptures, 39 books. Everything that he would say, Paul would say, Peter would say, every preacher that we would call minister, that the resurrection is first and foremost founded on the Old Testament, on the Hebrew Bible. But the other is that considering the time of the writing of this letter, probably around the early 50s, mid 50s, it is very possible that they would have had a gospel, most likely the gospel of Mark haven't already been written, and perhaps even floating around. Gospel is more like the biography of Jesus' life, his birth, all of his life, his growing up years, all of his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That the audience that Paul is writing to, the ones that he's considering, they would have known some of this. They would have already heard it. Word of mouth would have already spread. Now, I already mentioned to you that if you want to undertake just a casual reading of the book of Acts from the perspective of just looking at every sermon that we call uh, a speech, a lecture, a sermon, whatever you'd want to call it. If you wanted to take it under consideration, the theme is the resurrection. So let's look at the Apostle Paul's first sermon, just in terms of a summary for the sake of time. His first sermon is recorded in Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul. And it's a lengthy sermon. Very lengthy. But if you just take a small block, verses 30 through 37, there are two amazing things that happen. And this is probably about maybe 10, 15, 20 years prior to him writing 1 Corinthians 15. Two amazing things that happen. One is in Acts 13, verses 30 through 37, the Apostle Paul will mention Jesus' resurrection four times. God raised him. He was raised. He was brought back. Something of that nature. You'll see that language depending on the translation that you may have. Four times in seven verses, Paul is hammering home this minister, this people that he wants to preach to and hopefully give them an opportunity to believe. Resurrection, 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 resurrection. Church, we are the resurrected people of God. And it's because he was raised. And Paul stakes that, the entire sermon, but the entire faith on that. It's not just him. Peter does the same thing. Stephen does the same thing. So many others that are there. Multiple men at multiple places and multiple locations does this. You know what else he does? In those same seven verses, he also quotes the Old Testament three times. Three times he reaches back into the Hebrew Bible. Three times he reaches back into the Old Testament and finds support for the claim that he is making to his audience. Well, how do you know that Jesus is raised? Well, God said it would happen. Now, there is an element of faith that we must accept when it comes to this. There is no full-on ladder that would take us from bottom to top. At some point along the way, every person must make up their mind whether they're going to believe or not. Now, God doesn't invite us to just take a leap in faith. He is going to provide evidence, but He is not going to provide every single step. At some point, we must have faith in what we hear and or in what we read. Because if we didn't, then faith is not needed. And faith is not essential. And more likely, we have earned our way into belief. And that's not the case. If faith is needed, in the sense that without it, it's impossible to please God, then at some point we've got to take the available evidence that's there and make a decision. But that decision does require a step of faith, whatever it may be. When he is speaking to his audience in the book of Acts, or whether he's speaking to his audience in 1 Corinthians, or in Thessalonians, or wherever it may be, Paul will eventually bring them, here's the evidence, Take it under consideration, but you must take a step 
that is faith. At some point, we have to be able to communicate, whether it's to ourselves or those that we want desperately to believe. God said this. And at some point, I can't prove that. The only thing I can offer up is faith. But Paul reaches back into the Old Testament and says, this is the case. The first piece of evidence are the Scriptures themselves to take under consideration. The next piece is eyewitnesses. You know that if you take everybody that Paul mentions, you've got over 500 people that are there in a span of probably about 40, 50 days or so that saw a, a, a living, breathing Jesus who they knew died just three days prior. They saw him crucified to a cross. They saw nails in his hand. They saw all of these things. But three days later, over 500 people, over the course of 40 days after that, see a living, breathing Jesus. And that's what he says. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8, just kind of summarizing everything. And Jesus appeared. That word, and if you've just taken your own reading, your own time to read it, you'll see that that word appears, appears numerous times. And it means to hear and to see. So-and-so is going to make an appearance later today. Such and such made an appearance. I can't believe that. They did that. And we know what appearance means because we saw them. We heard them. Even if we didn't get an opportunity to shake their hand, even if we didn't have an opportunity to pat them on the back and say, thank you for coming, we heard them, we saw them. When Paul says that Jesus appeared, the individuals that he's about to mention, the groups that he's about to mention, the hundreds of people he's about to mention, heard him and saw them. Saw him. Jesus appeared to Cephas, the twelve. More than 500, James, all the apostles, and then Paul himself. Six different groups, all at different times, all in various ways, Jesus appeared. He didn't appear as a ghost. He didn't appear as a spirit. He appeared just like you and I, in flesh and blood. They heard him and they saw him. Now here's the thing to consider. That if he truly did not appear, again, that it is a lie. That's a big lie to keep to yourself among 500 people. I, I know, just to be honest, we've all fallen in the trap of lying before. You got to tell one lie, right? You tell one. What do you have to do to keep it? You got to tell another, and another, and another, right? You just got to keep doing it over and over. That's the trap of lying. And of course, all the other things that come along with it, once it's found out, then, you know, trust is eroded, respect is gone, so forth and so on. But in order to, to tell this lie that Jesus appeared, you got to tell another and another. At some point, guess what happens with the truth? We know this just practically, just living. What happens? It comes out. How in sync do over 500 people have to be for decades at a time to keep a lie going? Then... How in sync does that lie have to be with anyone who believes the original lie to have lasted for 2,000 plus years to our day and age? That's a lot of lies. Unless it's true. Unless he did appear. Unless he was hurt. Unless he was seen. And this is the first, not rock in a hard place, but where we're kind of forced. If it's a lie, I, don't, I can just go on my merry way. And I need to just go do what I want to do. Live how I want to live. But if this is true, if he truly did appear, in the sense that he was heard, and that he was seen, and there are other places that will say in the scripture that he was actually touched. I can't leave here the same person I was when I walked in here. I can't just lay down a certain type of life. 
pretend to be someone else for about an hour to two hours, and then go right back and pick that life back up. Because if he appeared, I got to deal with it. And I can't just pretend. And I can't just act as if nothing happened. Oh, I probably could. But then who is believing the lie then? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, when Luke, the author of the, of the gospel of Luke, writing his second edition, or second volume, if you will, part 2 to his part 1, begins the entire section of the book, the entire book of Acts with these words, that Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing, there's our word, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Notice the language. He presented many proofs, appearing, speaking. Again, these things put us in a position where a decision has to be made. Either what I just read in just one little verse, but four powerful things. Either I can just dismiss it, or I actually need to sit with it and take it under true and authentic and genuine consideration. The evidence, a piece of evidence that is offered up in our reading is the eyewitnesses. Which leads us to the third and final piece. And this is just my opinion with what I'm about to state. But I think it's the greatest piece of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. You know what it is? Me and you. What good is it for words on a page to be there? Ancient words that God took the time to have written down. What good is it if you and I don't live like it? When Paul presents his final piece of evidence, it's not the scriptures that he ends with. And it's not eyewitnesses. It's himself. For I, Paul, I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy to be called an apostle. Paul, why are you taking such a low view of yourself? Because I was a persecutor. What turns the most vicious opponent a first century Christianity and its most powerful proclaimer. What turns an individual who has no problem securing legal documents to throw people into prison or even have them killed, much less stoned, and within three days, His zeal doesn't change, his passion doesn't change, his knowledge doesn't change, his academic credibility doesn't change, but he changes. What is it? Unless Jesus appeared and he heard him and he saw him like the scripture asserts. He lifts himself up as a piece of evidence. Church, we should be the piece of evidence to a world that Jesus is alive. We don't need to make a claim in a safe and secure building. We need to live the resurrected life that he has given us himself. That we will be the mouthpiece and the hands and the feet. And either we will be its staunchest supporters and greatest promoter, and the one who will make sure, as best as possible, humanly possible, that reproach doesn't come but glory. Because we live the resurrected life that he has given us. One of my favorite verses comes right after this. And it's one of my favorites because of what he says at the very beginning. That here is this individual who meets a resurrected Christ. But he says, prior to that, I was the least, I was unworthy, and I was a persecutor. 
But you know what we should shout and sing and proclaim to everyone? Not because we got it right. Not because we earned our way or we did everything right here today. But because of what Paul is about to say. I am what I am by the grace of God. I am, if I take my view, I'm least, I am unworthy. If you take your view of yourself, you will have your own adjective. And the chances of it being a negative one are extremely high. But if Jesus is alive today, I am not least. And I am not unworthy. I am what I am by His grace. He didn't leave me in the least position. And He didn't leave me in the unworthy position. And he didn't leave me as a persecutor. But he found me. And he found me by appearing to me. And you know what Paul calls that? Grace. And three times in one, verses, one verse he mentions grace. I am, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, his grace was not in vain. What do you mean, Paul? What do you mean that it wasn't in vain? You mean change? No, 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 no. He appearing and he being alive is God's grace. He meeting me on the road to when I would arrest people and take them away from their jobs and break up families, perhaps even killing someone and shedding innocent blood. He appeared. And you know what I call that? Grace. You know what we call it? When we finally take things under consideration, grace. Yeah, we're, yes, we're unworthy. Yes, our sin is filthy. And it has separated us. But because He loves us, He gives us a living Jesus who appears. And for many of us, the living Jesus, there may be no miraculous appearing. But he appeared to us in someone who came to us one day. Maybe someone who invited us to service. Maybe someone who saw us sitting by ourselves and they found us and invited us to a dinner or to a lunch. Someone who saw us in our sorrow or in our grief. Someone who saw us in our shame and our embarrassment. When we extend a helping hand to whomever it is that we come in contact, do you know that Jesus is appearing to them? Because we believe. We believe in that. But grace is not grace if he's not alive. And all the things that we hold dear, right, grace and mercy and forgiveness and belonging, those mean absolutely nothing if he is not risen. Where are you today? Perhaps you've been in a discussion with someone. Perhaps you're just starting the journey. The invitation today, yes, is that if you have the need, and we hope that you do, in terms of seeing your sin and the weight and the guilt of it, but knowing that Christ and Christ alone can set you free, and it's not just a Christ, but it is a resurrected Christ then we want to encourage you to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. But perhaps the greater encouragement, the greater invitation is, is that if you're ready to undertake this, that here are these pieces of evidence, but you're ready to take this to the next step in a deeper and more meaningful study so that a decision can be made, we want you to do that here too. We want you to let us know how we can help you. And we can say that because someone helped us, starting with Jesus. And may I leave you with this challenge. If you wear the name of Christ, you are what you are by His grace. Now go and reveal Him to the people that you will come in contact with this very day. Go and be the evidence of God's grace and even more importantly, God's evidence to the resurrected Jesus to a world that needs it. If you have a need this morning, why don't you come as we stand, as we sing?